I'll just talk here a little. It'll, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Shane, so much. Man, I was extremely tired when I came here tonight, unusually tired. I did a lot of work the last two days at home, and I was unusually tired. My wife said, oh, you'll get perked up when you get there. Well, that break every chain song really got me. <laughs> and then that going to dance like I ain't never danced before song didn't hurt either. <laughs> Pam, you're my hero, man. I mean, you know, there's pregnant, and then there's pregnant, and she's pregnant. And she's like, I'm going to dance like I never danced before. She's going at it. I'm like. I just stopped. I watched her. You were dancing. Baby and all. She was going, man. I was like, whoa. (laughs) Shoo. Bless her, Jesus. Man, that Break Every Chain song, huh? The name of Jesus. You know, it's not a magic formula, the name of Jesus. It's not abracadabra. He's the Son of God. And it's very important that we learn to honor Him and know who He is and Really esteem it. Pastor said something about the clean hands things just a while ago. And sometimes we hear that legalistically and, and stuff like, no, there's a reason. Because when your hands are clean and you have a, a conscience that's crystal clear, you have confidence before God. That's, right. that's, the, that's, that's why. It's simple. It's not you're clean enough to be used by God. Your conscience is just crystal clear. You just stand before Him clean. Your conscience is crystal clear. But I was thinking about that song, Power of the Name of Jesus, Break Every Chain. And I thought, man, I'm thinking of the, how the evil spirits responded to Jesus in the Bible when he was on the earth. Right. And, and I mean, they're freaked out by him, like afraid of him, like they fear him. Right. Like there's nothing they can do about who God is, except try to distort our view and stuff. But as far as where them and God are concerned, I mean, look, they have no redemption. They're not in heavenly places anymore. They're... And there's nothing they can do about it because he's God. Come on, if they had a scheme, if they had power, they could ramp up and maybe get a strategy and overtake heaven or something, you know, like a movie. But it's not like that. Jesus is Lord. Serious. Think with me. So when we're singing this song, it's very important to understand. I remember preaching one time. I was getting a little, I was reminiscing while they were singing that song and about the name of Jesus. I was preaching one time on Jesus being our high priest and that right now as I'm speaking, he's, he's at the right hand of Almighty God on behalf of all men and his work is accomplished. And it's powerful to know that so you don't just get into the routine of in the name of Jesus. Because when you speak his name, you're saying something. What he accomplished, what he fulfilled, who he is. It's, it's a reverent, holy, incredible privilege that we can bear his name, speak his name, Manifest the power of His name as sons and daughters of God. Amen? So man, just, just, I, just, I just wanted to say that it's, it's, it's not an abracadabra thing. We're not, it's not a magic potion formula. His name's not synonymous to abracadabra. His name is the name above every name. So uh, there's, there's something that's really on my heart. It's been on my heart. You hit it in that break. A little break you took in the middle there. I think you were checking on Pam, weren't you? You were. He loves you. He was checking on you. I think she's having the baby. <laughs> sure, it's whisper. Or else it's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it is the Holy Ghost, wasn't it? I know, because she was dancing. Did you see her dancing? <laughs> she was dancing. That's amazing. Oh, you are my hero. <laughs> hey, you guys could hear me on the thing when you were worshiping. Who had the ear things in? Did you hear me tell him I was, that you were my favorite and that I don't tell everybody that everywhere I go? Oh, yeah, oh, she said they turned it down right before that, see? I said, that's awesome if they could hear because then she caught that. <laughs> oh. I tell them they're my favorite, and they really are. They say I tell everybody that when I travel. It's not true. Pastor said something amazing. He talked about receiving the love of God when he took the little break. I really do have something to say, I promise. He talked about receiving the love of God. I'm sitting here thinking, Lord, you want me to talk about receiving your love. It's one thing to believe to be healed. And I know that phrase and understand why we talk like that. It's another thing to receive a love of God. To receive a love of God, I just believe is is healing. Yeah, help me, Jesus, say this tonight so clear. I was just preaching. I was just preaching, just real, real recent preaching. 
You know how you got a situation that doesn't change? Who's ever had a situation that doesn't change in your body? And then your mind becomes an enemy after a while. If you're not really, really, really walking close in relationship with Jesus, you've got a million questions. All of a sudden, the fact that your body didn't change invokes a whole lot of questions. The questions keep your mind spinning. God's love usually is in question. And all of a sudden, intimacy and relationship seems at bay because our focus is, why am I not healed? Why isn't this working? How come I haven't been healed? When am I going to be healed? And all that stuff. So what we're going through in that sense, sometimes the way we interpret it keeps this from not getting closer if, in fact, farther. Does that make sense? I've been noticing this. I pay attention. I travel a lot. I don't just preach the gospel. I really pay attention. I care about people and things and I listen and I watch. And there's mindsets that I see that are very common among us all across the country. And I was just preaching recently and I was talking about the love of God and I was talking about righteousness and who we are in Christ and God's love for us and the purpose of the cross. And I was just sharing the stuff I always share. And I was talking about how valuable you and I are to God. And this lady was in the congregation, not praying for the sick. I, I could tell you actually a handful of these testimonies. They're fun to me. But I'm going to tell you this one. John, I'm going to tell you this one. <laughs> she, 10 years, auto accident, 10 years, a lot of pain in her body, 10 years. Prayed for a whole lot. It's one thing trying to be healed for 10 years, it's another thing to just receive the love of God for 10 years. I would encourage you to receive the love of God. Because <laughs> healing is in that mix. It's just that way. Now, I understand the power of the name of Jesus and the believers, and we can pray, and we're all growing into that, and we're going after that, and we're going to keep preaching that. But who knows that everybody that we're touching, we haven't seen just jump up and go, whoa! So we need to talk about this. Because the people that are jumping up going, whoa, that's a simple, whoa. But the people that aren't, where do they go from there? And if we keep talking like nothing happened, why wasn't I healed, man, I hope it. All those questions unsettle you, disestablish you, if that's a correct word, and keep you from growing closer in intimacy. I've, I've, I'm learning this. I'm seeing this. I'm like, whoa. Now, I'm not, this lady, this was just fun. She's not thinking of healing. She's just... She's just listening and she's going, I have value to God. He loves me. Sometimes when you have sickness and you've been prayed for and nothing seems to happen, that, it's amazing how the question rises up right away about God's affection towards you, his love for you. Is everything wrong Did I, or right? Did I do something wrong? Is there a reason? Did you ever notice that happens to people? All the time. So if those questions are in your mind, are you even receiving the love of God? Or is the love of God in question? Are you in question? I'm, every time you hear me preach, I'm preaching this kind of stuff. See, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, we could dig in the Bible and preach a sermon. We could, but man, we got to get through every day in victory and in joy. And we have to have a vision for tomorrow. And do you know what I mean? So... She's receiving the love of God through the message and she's in her heart thinking, man, I'm worth the blood. God knew me from the beginning. My life's not an accident. I, while she's receiving the truth about her through Jesus, her back goes... And for the first time in 10 years, she's completely normal. No one prayed for her. Nobody released faith. Nobody even talked about healing. But her body came into agreement with wholeness when her heart said, I am precious to God. <laughs> wow. And I can tell you a few of those testimonies. That's like, wow. She said, I'm precious to God. Wow. And her body goes. <laughs> and she goes, huh? She was checking, she come running up to tell me that while I was preaching on identity, her body aligned. And that she had been prayed for for 10 years. 10 years. What do we need? Huh? 
yeah, man, I didn't know if you were worshiping Jesus or raising question and answer, raising your hand. Come on. This is Shane, sound man. But actually, he's a son before a sound man. <laughs> but he's the one that got this thing cranking. Go ahead, man. See, you're not on your job. <laughs> oh, there's another Shane. We got a pair of Shanes. You were up there. I didn't even see you up there, buddy. Um, this is amazing that you're even talking on this right here because I got a testimony. Exactly what you just Good, were given. And I want to share it with y'all. Please. Um, Try and make it a little short because I know Dan likes Just to... Just share it, share it, share it. No, this is the will of God, this okay. message, I believe. <laughs> In 2006, I was working on the job, and I used to load cars onto a trailer. And I was leaning over, and I was working really late, and I was tired. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like Velcro in both my knees go... <laughs> and pain shot through my knees. Um, I lost stability. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, what am I going to do? This is, I was providing for my family, and, it, and my knees are all messed up. And, and I knew something drastic was wrong with them, like either right. torn ACL or something like that. So, so my wife was going to a Saturday night service, and Todd was going to be there. And this is just me being introduced to the truth. And uh, I said, Todd, can you pray for my knee? Because I knew something had to change or it it wasn't going to be good. <laughs> so he, he prayed for my knee, and nothing happened. And he prayed another time, bent down. He just commanded the knee to be made whole, and nothing happened. And he's like, all right, I'm going to pray one more time. And, and he, he prayed for my knee, in the name of Jesus, be whole. And, and I, I tested it out every time he prayed, and I had pain. And, but this third time, it was totally healed. I felt no pain. I was, and he looks at me, he goes, you're going to cry? And I'm like, no, I'm happy. I'm, my leg's healed. But I guess out of the excitement, I never asked him to pray for my other knee. <laughs> so, so two weeks ago, I, I worked a really hard week, and I, I do a lot of manual labor, physical labor, and I was sore all over, and even my totally healed knee was sore, but my other knee that I, I didn't get healed was was really bad and I come home and my little girl's like daddy come play with me come and I'm like honey I am just so exhausted I just want to sit here and relax and it's just breaks your heart when they want to play with you so I'm like what's the best thing you do is just get in the presence of your dad so I put some worship on and, and this song comes on it's amazing and even though I'm exhausted I'm like daddy you're here and his presence came mm. in the kitchen and I'm like I want to dance with you. So, so I got up and I just started dancing with him. And all of a sudden I just go, oh, my knees are healed. <laughs> I had no pain. No. I didn't ask him to heal me. I didn't say, Daddy, I don't know about this. It's, it might hurt. Um, please heal my knees so I can dance with you. I just said, I don't care in my spirit. And I just got up and danced with him. And in my kitchen, I just sit there go, oh, daddy. <laughs> and and my, my little girl had her friend over, and she's freaked out. Why is your dad crying and screaming like that? But she comes in and goes, my little girl, Chloe, goes, fire on you, daddy. Fire on you, daddy. <laughs> so it's just amazing what Dan's talking about is that I wasn't asking for a healing. I wasn't saying, God, heal me. I just wanted to be with him. And, and in his love, he looks at Come us on. as children and says, I don't want my boy. I don't want my girl like that. Come to me. And there's healing in that love because he loves us as little kids. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Well, let me just jump in this and just spring with where he's at and where, where I was hearing in my heart. Because here's the deal. We live by faith. Faith is the substance, the realization of what we're hoping for. So faith is the knowing, the absolute certainty. Faith is not a shot in the dark. Faith is the substance, the tangibility, the realization of what you hope for. It's the evidence of what you haven't yet seen. So faith's a big deal. 
and, and to just live by faith. It says without doubting. So whether, whether you're the person praying, the minister, or the recipient, there's a place where faith is, is very important in this equation. We're trying to build faith in everybody. We teach here very strongly that not everybody needs faith in that equation. The person praying, releasing the kingdom is the person, obviously, that's in faith, right? But I've watched this paradox. When you don't see things change, I've heard language like, I don't know why it nothing happened. I don't know, well, nothing happened. Well, I don't know why God didn't heal. And, and we're rationally taking the result of something we prayed for to define the will of God, the heart of God, the circumstance. And here's my thought tonight. It's very simple. And, and, and I don't know how long I'll have to camp here, but I'm just going to make this point tonight, and I feel like we'll do well if we do this. You and I it's imperative that we settle on the gospel, the finished work of Christ and God's unchanging love for us and heart towards us as the foundational truth of our lives. That God is a yes and amen God. He loves me and that will never change. He's for me. That will never change. He, he sees me righteous through His Son. That will never change. He sees me as if I'd never sinned. I'm a son. I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint. He, God loves me. So the gospel has to be the finished work of Christ, the the foundational truth of my life. The yes of my life. So God is for me, period. Period. You get what I'm saying? So no matter what, this truth is what I live in. No matter what doesn't make sense, no matter, I was just preaching here this week and I, t I, t I told the people, listen, because I got hit with four different people with all the same questions that you hear. It don't care if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast. When there's something that hasn't happened and the church has prayed, it's amazing how every state of this nation we all say the same things. And none of them are productive, helpful, and none of them are going to bring change. They just bring confusion. And what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying here tonight in, 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 in my home congregation is, let's just throw away all those questions because you can't answer them anyway. They're not even questions. Let's settle on what's been answered, what we know to be true, camp there, let that be our truth, that be our reality, and live from that place. So Shane isn't walking around questioning anything because of his knee or knees. He's, he's not questioning anything. He's receiving God's love. His primary heart and purpose toward God was just being with his Father. And in that place, here's a testimony, a live testimony. He runs up here and this just happened. Woo! And he's crying. Why? Because receiving God's love, it just flowed. That There's something so powerful about that. There's so... I, I get approached when you travel, you get approached and people say, can you please pray for me? I've been prayed for many times. I have never been healed. I've been prayed for by so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Could you please pray for me? And I, <laughs> you feel like you're on a list, you know. <laughs> but you're like, you've got to pull yourself together. Say, it's God's love for that person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you pray. And here's the, can I be real? You see some of those things change. And then you're afraid they're going to think it's because you prayed for them. And other people didn't. It didn't happen. When you prayed, it did happen. So then that interprets to something like it was you, gifting, anointing, whatever, but it was you. <laughs> or nothing happens in the sense of right now. But in my heart, it's never nothing happens. You follow what I'm saying? So my concern for us is how are we going to keep running this race worthy of a prize if our face value is our reality, our truth, and always defining God? When what he did through his son is the truth, and that should define us, period. And we should always, can always be privileged to be in a position to receive God's love and see his value towards us, no matter what we're going through, because we're in a war, and stuff's going on, and things are poking and prodding, and stuff just happens sometimes, but it does never change God. You follow what I'm saying? So, him loving you, Without fail, without change, has to stay strong in your heart. Looking in the mirror and seeing your value through the cross and through the Son of God is imperative in your life to never even question that based on what's going on and what has and hasn't happened, what's been answered and hasn't been answered concerning prayer. There's a big difference between trying to get a healing and receiving God's love. 
Huge. <laughs> Love never fails. Sometimes you try to get a healing. Now you're just trying harder. You're striving. You're everywhere. You, you, the sickness has become who you are. And I'm not being insensitive. I know some of this stuff is tough. It's cost us a lot. It hurts. It's cost us money. It's I understand that. I, I, I'm saying in the worst of the worst position, there's a place for our heart to be sure of His love. And I'm just convinced that faith is always found there because faith works through love. And it's a real paradox and I feel like we're spinning sometimes in this, we're preaching the kingdom and it's right. And we're preaching it's the will of God to heal and it's right. And we're preaching and there's momentum and there's things and there's a cancer leaving and, and things. But, but you bump into this, this cancer that didn't leave. Who's ever done that? Sure. <sighs> and, and we cannot let that just keep throwing us into this language that seems rational it's always about this receiving his love it's God you're amazing towards me and you just got told the things worse and you were just prayed for on a Saturday night and it's worse your test is worse and without blinking an eye father I just so thank you for the gospel I know my body doesn't feel itself and I know what they just told me that test says but I know what you've established in me you're for me I have great value to you. You shed your blood that I might live. And I thank you for your love. That sure beats what's wrong. What am I missing? Why am I being healed? Why is it getting worse? Because all those questions seem to almost always be there in that scenario. The Bible says believe and don't doubt in your heart. Sometimes we pray and we think prayer is the end. Like we think because we prayed there's faith. No, we pray because there's need. A lot of times. I'm just being real. We're not praying because there's faith. We're praying because there's need. Is that fair? Am I okay? You guys are just. <laughs> I never know what you expect when you come here. But it's me. You ought to know I talk like this all the time. This kind of stuff. <laughs> you guys are looking at me pretty blank tonight. <laughs> is he going to preach? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> A lot of times we pray because we're, we're, we're problem-driven people. We don't realize it. The only reason we should pray is because we have an answer. We have a promise. We're not praying because it's a shot in the dark and maybe a God up there in the clouds is going to hear. We should be inspired to pray because we have His Word. Because we know who God is. Because we know His heart through sending His Son. His love's been revealed and established in us. The reason we pray isn't... We're not driven by the crisis. It's because Christ has come. So there's an answer that's already been given. And, and what I'm saying tonight is, and what's really in my heart is, like Pastor got up here in the break there in between, and he's just talking a little, and, 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 and he said about, I think there's something so powerful about receiving the love of God. And we've been told for so long this and this and all the derogatory, but, but I think there's something so amazing about receiving the love of God. And I'm sitting there going, you had no idea this. I'm thinking... I'm really supposed to talk about the imperativeness of receiving God's love personally in the midst of every circumstance, whether the, whatever. Because you be honest with me, how many times among us have we seen that challenged by what hasn't changed? Rationally challenged about God because of what hasn't changed. Here's the deal. This has to be truth, period. God loves you. Period. Amen. Never to be challenged, questioned, or changed. Come on, I know how quick we can sell out on some of this stuff with reason. Well, yeah, but if God loved me, then how come? And Well, then why? Well, we, well I prayed and I believed with how come? And we, we reserve this right to shift and change on who we see God to be. And that reveals that we're not locked in and established. And there really isn't faith. We're being problem driven. And if we as ministers don't understand this, we'll get trapped in the same way and we'll just be praying, hoping for results, praying, hoping for results. No, we're praying because God loves people. He sent His Son. There is power in the name of Jesus. So, so when we pray, it's, it's not even that it's possible. When we pray, we believe it's God's will. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And preach that. I believe it's the will of God to heal. And then we say, well, then how come everybody isn't healed? That's the first question that pops out. Because we're thinkers. We don't even live out of our heart. The first question, then how come everybody isn't healed? 
And we, we think that prayer is like, like, like the gospel is like, you know, a formula. It's a revelation, carries weight and authority, no compromise. He says, believe, ask believing, don't doubt in your heart. He that doubts in his heart, even when you ask for wisdom, you have to know God's for you. It says, you ask for wisdom, God will what? Freely, liberally, he'll give it without reproach. But let him who asks believe and not doubt that it's coming. Because here's what we tend to do. Well, I wonder if God even heard me. Well, I wonder if God will give me wisdom. Well, you know me. I'm pretty. I don't even know if God can help me. <laughs> so we're asking, and then we're questioning based on sometimes low esteem, our ability to receive. And next thing you know, we're, we're doubting. We're, we're asking. It's right to ask, but then we're questioning. And the Bible's very clear. It says that person, don't let that person that's living in that place think, they'll receive anything from God because actually what they're doing is they're being tossed by the, like the sea, the waves of the sea by the wind. Because you're, you're asking like God would care and then you're questioning if He really does or if you'll receive it. You see what I mean? So the Bible itself is teaching us, man, we need to be locked in and established in the faith. God's love for you through Jesus Christ must be settled is what I'm crying out tonight. Come on, if I drove here just to say that one thing, we can live off of that and we can run well. We have, I know it doesn't sound like some deep revelation, but listen, we've got to get established in this thing. You've heard me say this a thousand times if you've ever listened to me preach. The, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and Christ died and crucified and raised from dead is the measuring stick of God loving you. And it should never ever be questioned or challenged by anything because it's already settled he came <laughs> yeah but if they love me then how come and why didn't he and then what and when that question is permitted there's no way we're receiving God's love he's actually in question you follow me and faith works through and love's in question, so now we're back to need-driven people that are hurting in our heart because we didn't get the answer to our prayer. Listen, I, I could have a situation in my life and all that I preach, I, I would be the first person people would tend to say, well, he ought to know, well, if he has a revelation, well, then how come? And all these questions rise up. If a fellow like me doing what I do would have a circumstance or a situation, there are so many questions that fly up out of that instead of just believing and God will walk him through that. Well, he's going to get through because, well, how come? I wonder why. Well, how'd that do it? Well, how'd that do it? Well, how come? Well, if he's righteous, well. You said, do you have a question or comment or something? What's up, man? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and I got a whole lot of questions probably I could open up when I start talking like this tonight. I don't, I believe if you don't fail to receive the love of God in your sickness or, or disease or situation of sickness or disease and you don't fail, I believe ultimately you will become stronger. It's impossible to not become stronger. I don't believe scripturally the Bible teaches that God uses sickness as a tool to accomplish that. He can just pour himself out upon you. He gives you his word, the fellowship of the spirit. But here's the deal. If I'm in this place, it's a good question because I was just using myself as an example. So if I'm in this place and I don't lose sight of God's love and even in the midst and I don't let this thing overtake my identity and I still have joy in my heart, I still have love, I'm still a peacemaker, I still intercede effectively, I still can believe and release the kingdom, this thing doesn't line up but it doesn't become my identity. His love towards me becomes my identity. It's impossible to keep your eyes fixed on Him and not become stronger. In the face of adversity, in the face of trial, in the face of sickness. Do you see what I mean? Now, I had a lady recently walk up to me. She was born with some form of diabetes, found out when she was younger. She's been a Christian now her whole life. And, and she said, you know, can you please pray for me? I have this thing from childhood. And 
I know it's my right to be healed and I know it's the kingdom to be healed. And she started to proclaim all her rights. And I said, wow. I said, honey, this thing has thrown you, hasn't it? You've been a very hurt, very confused and almost condemned person. She's burst out bawling. She's holding on to her Christian rights to be healed. I know, I know it's the will of God to heal me. So she's using this. As, she's got principles here. But God's love is so in question because she hasn't been healed. So she's desperately quoting her rights and her heart is out of touch with even her personal value and, and, and the love of God for her. So if we, the church, aren't touching her and seeing her change, because we can, but if we're not, she still needs help and she can't be succumbed to the thing that didn't change. Do you see what I mean? All I did, I perceived what she was thinking for the, while she was talking for the last bunch of years, and I said, you feel this and this, and you feel like something's wrong with your faith, and if you would spruce up, you could be, and you're under pressure, and you're condemned. She was bawling. Now, she's carrying that every day. Now, if she's believing that every day, is she even able to receive God's love for her? Until that thing changes in her body, she can't. Are you following me? It breaks my heart because we're not producing everything we could produce as ministers. Let's just be honest. Everybody we're touching isn't jumping up and going, Hallelujah, I'm healed. But there has to be a way to continue on and not lose sight of who you are and have a shame experience in the love of God. Watch, whether your knees got healed or not. But because this hasn't changed, it eliminates us and exempts us from that place if we don't see clear. Because it's like a mark against us. It grays out our soul. It does something. And I'm just telling every one of us, we have the right and the privilege in the midst of whatever we're going through to receive His love. It's top priority. You're worth the blood of Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because there's just too much confusion and all this praying for the sick when the sick don't seem to be healed. Way too much. When I did the Kingdom Living School, who was in the first little pilot school we did? Anybody? The first little... Yeah. yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah, commercial. Kingdom Living School. Remember when we taught on healing for like a week and I, did, I cried all the time and I got real passionate? I remember coming to your office crying. It was the hardest... I'm not saying this put heavy on any students. It was the hardest week of my Christian life as a teacher. That's not an exaggeration. I didn't even know what to do. I, I came into your office crying. Yeah. <laughs> no, I came into your office crying and I said, I was, I was, I was overwhelmed. I said, why can't we hear? It's here. Why can't we just hear? Why can't we? We're so rash. It's no reflection on the students, but here's the deal. Some of the students might remember, because I left it open for questions in the school. So I'd be teaching every day, even in the end of the week. How long was the school? Three out. How many? Three hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Twelve hours. For twelve hours, I talked and asked her, answered questions and looked at Scripture on the last day from the same group of students I was getting the same questions I got on the first day. As if I didn't preach anything. Is that true, Sue? It overwhelmed me. I cried. I didn't even know what to do. I, I didn't even know what to do. I said, this thing... And I'm not prophesying some bad thing over us. I'm saying in reality, this thing was become like a stronghold. The way we think, the rationale, the human reasoning, the, the, the taking natural evidence and subpoenaing it against truth. Taking face value and making that our reality and then challenging what the Bible says. And every question and everything made total sense, but here's the deal. It's the way that seems right. So... So last year, the last school we did, I, I said, God, I need your help. And I, and I didn't know what to do because I'm not used to this, but I felt, 
in my heart uneasy about getting on the subject of healing because I thought, here we go again. And because it, it was, you have no idea, it was a painful, I wasn't frustrated or mad at anybody. It was breaking my heart. It was, I was crying. I felt like we couldn't hear because our minds rationally working that we couldn't hear and just be locked in to receive God's love because here's what we don't understand. All those questions that just pop off reveal unestablished identity and a broken fellowship with receiving God's love. That's what we're not getting. Do you follow this? I'm, I'm just trying to be harsh. When you got those questions, okay, so we're faith, faith, faith people, right? Man, don't be faith, faith, faith people. Receive God's love. Faith works through love. If you receive God's love, you're going to be a faith person. But you're not a faith person. You're children of God. Don't stereotype yourself because here's the deal. When you're faith people, and then something breaks through and sneaks through the cracks and grabs you, guess what happens? wonder how this is happening. Wonder why this, wonder what I did wrong. Wonder what door I opened. Wonder why God's allowing us. Wonder why the enemy. Question after question just automatically pops up because the circumstance suggests all these questions and all of a sudden you don't even have an established identity. There's no love of God flowing because now you've become a product of this and you're confused by it and you got a lot of questions. The questions need to go. Okay. If I woke up tomorrow with a serious situation in my body, I don't even want to understand to even think those questions. What's that have to do with fighting the good fight of faith? Receiving God's love and staying in the truth is what makes me free. So in that thing that I wake up in, it's not, oh my God, now I become a product of that and now I'm fighting for help. No, Father, I just thank you that your gospel, your truth, your love never changes and fails. God, I'm your son. You love me. Why should this have so much power to question what's already settled? What I'm going through should never have the right to define who God is. Who God is always has the ability to change what I'm going through. We can't turn it around. Are you guys following me? These, these kind of messages are, are to help us live our life. So I know they're not rah, rah, wow. But I'm telling you, these kind of things will get us through. This last school, so this last school, I said, Lord, and the Lord said, just be right up front and share. And I, when I talked to him, I shared the experience the year before. And, and I was like, so listen, guys. And, and some of the same questionings happened. But I was very open and honest and told him it was a very hard week for me. The hardest week preaching I've ever had. It made me cry the whole week. And I realized how much we're letting life define truth. If I'm already settled in truth, I'm already locked in in truth. Jesus said, this is the reason I came to Pilate. I might bear witness to the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Jesus, his life, his words. <laughs> Yay. Yay. So why do we have yell but? So if Jesus loves you, well, yeah, but he can't really love me. I mean, I should have known better, and I've had the truth in me for a while, and I haven't really been faithful with God, and he has to be very disappointed, and I should have. And all of a sudden, you can rationalize it. All you want in God's love is just towards you. He wants to love you. So you heed those convictions. You say, yeah, what am I doing? What am I thinking? Wow. But I promise you, in that, you could, you could be passing 15 years away in that mess and all God does is love you and wants you to see and wish you would just receive. And we're coming up with some reason why we can't. And he already sent his son. Here's a good one from Christians. Well, but I knew better before I did it. Okay, well now you really know better. Hello? 
So, so, so people say this stuff and none of it changes God's love towards you. Yeah, but I knew better. Well, you think you knew better. You had a natural conviction and then you did it and then you went, whoa. And now you really know better is what I'm saying by that. So what do you do then? Duh! What was I thinking? God! And you run to Him. Instead of come up with a reason why you can't when He loves you. Because then, right in the face of that, here's what happens in the face of that stuff. Right then is when a sickness will pop up. Right then is when a circumstance will pop up. And now, now, we can't even believe for it because I deserved it. I brought it upon myself. How can I believe God when I knew better and didn't? And the, the thing goes on and it's... Ah! At some point, we guys got to say, whoa, well, I was yet a sinner. He sent the Son. I was messing up bad, and He did it all right. I think I'm going to step out of here over into Him. I might have been messing up bad here the last three months. I might have been truly backslidden. I might have been, but my heart's attention is up right now, and God's the same. Bam. Out of darkness into light. Not, I hope He loves me. Are you following me? Now here's why I'm not afraid to preach this, because this doesn't give you an exception to sin and stuff. It actually will put such an integrity toward God in you because nobody loves you, ever loves you like that. And if you start receiving His love like that and really believe in His love like that, you'll, you'll, you'll build... This is good. This has this young man's comment a while ago too. In the midst even of that sickness, you will build such an integrity towards God. You see, you see what I mean? Such a, an honor towards God. You won't have to bite your lip and try to be a good Christian. You'll love God because you see His first love. Do you understand? When I, I took this homeless man to Walmart and got him a whole bunch of clothes and and, and change of stuff, he, was, he wasn't doing well. And he had towels wrapped around his feet, and that was his shoes, and it broke my heart. So get in the truck, let's go to Walmart. The question I got over and over from him, from the young man at Walmart, and the cash register, you don't even, why would you do this? Why not? Do you see how we think? Why would you do it? Why not? But you don't know him. He's a human being. Do I have to know him? Do you see how rational we think? Why would you do that? I'm telling you emotionally and passionately. Why not? Do I have to have a reason? So, so he's drunk. He's on a bottle. He's homeless. So, so do I go to church, yay, Jesus, and then look at him and think, boy, he needs to clean up. Boy, if he dropped that bottle and he's quit ruining his life and get himself a... He doesn't even know how he got that way anymore. It's been so long. Amen. He doesn't even have a clue. He's deceived and hurt and messed up and probably made his share of mistakes and probably does need to have done things better, but... But time's gone on and now he's reduced to this. But Jesus shed his blood. He's predestined to be a son. I do not need a reason Amen. to take him to Walmart. He's already a human. Amen. So I take him to Walmart. I get him on stuff. Walmart is a good place to go. I'm not a shopper. My wife's a shopper. But Walmart, you can buy some stuff for cheap. I dressed him up, and it didn't even cost me that much. <laughs> Got him nice new sneakers. Threw them nasty towels away. 19-year-old said, you, you, you getting him? You should have seen him going through Walmart. Because he's drunk. People don't even know what to do with him. They're spreading around him, spreading out. Oh, my God, why is he in Walmart? He's got feces all over his pants. Just, he's a mess. Man, when you see that, you'd want to put a new bed. I don't care if he, well, I care if he drinks another bottle, but I don't care if he drinks another bottle. That's not, I'm not getting him close so he stops drinking. 
Well, why would you get him the clothes? He's just going to go back now and drink a bottle anyway. You give me five bucks for food, he's just going to buy whiskey. That's what we do. Well, you watch the rest of the story. The whole time on the way to Walmart, you're really doing this? Why would you do this? I said, why wouldn't I? I said, you don't understand the gospel at all, do you? Well, no, let me tell you about Jesus. And I told him about Jesus. He broke down about three times to cry. Every time he did, I laid my hand on his forehead and kept driving. <laughs> it's dead. <laughs> One time I think I prayed in tongues. <laughs> The 19-year-old said, you don't even know him? You're getting him all these clothes? We had the towels he'd had wrapped around his feet were nasty, nasty. And I didn't want people offended him more than they could bear. It was nasty. Dick, it was nasty. I'm not afraid of them towels. I'm not afraid to pick them towels up. I'm in covenant. I'm not afraid. I want to just get them off the floor and get them away from people. People were going to gross out. Them towels were nasty. Right then, this garbage can goes rolling by, a 19-year-old pushing it, and I grab him, and I said, hey, I need your help. I told him the situation. He said, you don't even know the guy? I said, well, no, I just met him. He said, why would you do that? I said, why not? And he looked at me. I said, son, why do I need a good reason? He's a person in trouble. I'm not, I just want to help him. I just want to put clean clothes. It has to feel good to get clean stuff on it. So he went, that's awesome. Whoa. And he got it. And he said a couple things that were really cool. Get to the cash register. I got all the receipts in my hand. The lady said, you don't even know. You just met him? I said, yes. She said, why would you do this? I said, do you know he said that? The young man said that? Now you're saying that. My question to you is, why wouldn't I? And she went, I said, you give me one reason why not. Is it just each to his own, every man for himself? Is that the way? It's a survival? Is it still survival? Or has Christ come to save the ungodly, to die for the undeserving? To make worthy the unworthy. Has Christ come? Yes. Yeah. What have we done so right to be sitting here filled with His Spirit? I'll tell you what we've done right. We've believed. That's it. Yeah. So if He lets me put clothes on Him, that's a good start. That's a form of believing. You can get self-righteous and religious on this one and miss the whole gospel. You can think he has to clean up first. Well, you didn't have to clean up first. Yeah, thank God, huh? So the long story short, I'm dropping him off on the sidewalk. I'm not in, I don't live in that town, and I needed to get him out of my truck just because I had to be somewhere that I'm committed to be, but I got to squeeze this in, and it was fun. I didn't do it for a testimony. I didn't even tell anybody about it for quite a while. But the only reason I tell about it now is because of what he said in the truck. Because not one time did he look me in the eyes. And he kept saying, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe it. So every time he said it, I just preached the gospel of God and love. Every time. So I figured sooner or later he's going to get it. <laughs> I talked to him about drinking and why he's drinking. Mistakes he's made, some of the bad things done. I got some discernment on him. The Lord showed me a few things, and he didn't want to cry, he, he, but he cried on the inside, I promise, three or four times, and almost on the outside, and it was evident. It was good. It was just God on him, in my truck. And he looked nice. He gets out. I said, listen, Billy, I got to drop you off, man. I got to get somewhere, but it's been fun this morning. Thanks for letting me take you to Walmart. He's like, I just can't believe you took me to Walmart. I said, well, believe it, buddy. You got the clothes on, and I took you to Walmart, man. No strings attached. I'll probably never see you again in my life. I'm from out of town. I'm just passing through. But, boy, it was a great privilege to just do this and help you. See, the reason I met him in the first place, I see him walking up the alley, and he was hobbling. And you know how we are. You know what we teach. I'm like, do-do-do-do-do. I thought he hurt his foot. So I'm going to pray for his foot. Because I'm a real Christian and I don't just preach this stuff. I actually live this way when I'm out there by myself in the alley. So I ran up the alley and said, hey, man. And when I got close to him, I went, whoa, man. I realized this is more than a hurt foot. And then I found out that that wasn't a hurt foot. That was his shoe. And it tore me up. So I couldn't, I couldn't just stop with, can I pray for your foot? That's too easy. How about if I just go out of my way and be a good Samaritan and take my time, my money, and help try to at least help somehow, practically. 
So that's how I met him. In the morning, I couldn't go. I was going to a bunch of teens to pour my heart into a bunch of youth that night. So I asked him if I could meet him here at 1030. He said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm homeless. I hang out here. And I said, good deal. When I showed up, he said, you really came. You really came. You actually came. I said, well, yeah. So he's in my truck. He's ready to leave. I'm telling him to get out of my truck. Come on, Billy. You got to go. I got to go preach the gospel. And he's stalling. And he's, and he's, and he's, and he's stalling. And he lifts his head and looks me right in the eyes first time. And he said, you know, well, here's what he did. He's in my truck and he said, you know, you know, I think I can say I love you. And the Spirit of God came upon me. And he said, no one loves me except my first love. And he said, you are the love of God towards men. That's what the Lord said to me. We're waiting for him to stop drinking. Jesus is waiting for you to love him. He said, you know, I think I can say I love you. And I went, Spirit of God came on me. He said, Dan, nobody loves me first except they see my first love. You are my love towards men. And I cried and I said, Billy, get out of my truck. <laughs> I got to go, man. Get out of my truck. <laughs> get out. <laughs> he gets out of my truck. I hugged him. He gets out of my truck and he's standing on the street corner and I'm pulling out and he's bent over looking at you. And I'm like, see ya. <laughs> what an experience. You say, well, he might have got drunk that night. He might have. But he did get loved. Unconditionally, with no string. He didn't get close, so he comes to church. I didn't get him closed so he attends the prayer meeting. I got him closed because he was dirty. I didn't get him closed so he comes to a service. You don't give him water on a hot day so you can preach to him. You give him water because they're thirsty. Well, we're marketing the gospel. It's manipulation. I didn't get him close to preach to him. I got him close because he needed him. Now, is it my responsibility to pick up every homeless man I ever see? I did it. It was right. It worked. It was God. But I tell you what, if every one of us in the church would just think that way, plain and simple, without any string, it would make an incredible difference in society. Incredible. Incredible. You say, well, yeah, but he's still drinking. Forget about that for a minute. How long did God's Spirit woo some of you? How many opportunities did God give you to come into His arms? How many times did you see and then rub it out of your eyes? <laughs> and then see and... <laughs> come on! How many of you were convicted and drawn for long seasons of time before you finally knelt before Him and allowed Him to love you? And that 35 years, thanks for honesty. And then we'll get so shallow and self-righteous and forget that and say, well, he's probably drinking tonight anyway. Well, he might be, but I promise you he was loved. And now Holy Spirit has an amazing seed down inside of him that says if the sower would just sow <laughs> and go home and sleep at night. <sighs> I tell you, it felt so good in my hotel that night. I was just... Oh. <laughs> And you wake up in the morning and, whoa, how do you do it, God? It's not my responsibility to save that man. Only God can save that man. But I'll tell you one thing. It's my privilege to love him and send him the message of who God is, period. Did you get it? Now watch. Here's that man in that situation. And here we are. We've already received Christ. Christ. We probably can get rid of all the questions 
And now that Christ came settled, you know what? He loves me. He's for me. He can't possibly be against me because he gave his son that I might have life. Why I was yet a sinner, he came. I bet you tonight we could just settle the score on something. We're worth the blood of Jesus to God the Father. And come hell or high water, sickness or wholeness, the truth of his love doesn't change. And even like Shane, even though his knees weren't the best at the time, that wasn't his priority. That even wasn't even his motivation. Just being with Father was his motivation. When I got saved in 95, June 9th, I was probably heading for a serious surgery. I did a lot of heavy lifting. My back and my hip was so bad that I had that sciatic thing going on all the time. All the time. And I just painting through it, ignoring it. I'm 33, man, I'm too young for this. I can't be having problems, whatever. And I've just pushed through work every day. But it was obvious. I couldn't get around the pain. And I never even talked about it because I just was like, whatever. Do you know what I mean? It was too, it was too like big for me at that time. I was 33. Married, I got kids, I got to work. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm not taking time off. I'm not going to the doctors. I'm just, I tried the whole chiropractor thing. It just seemed like it was worse down the road. And I was in trouble every day of my life working. I could tell you that. I got born again, Pastor, that night. I, I fell in love. I don't like that phrase, fell in love, because you can fall out, I guess. But I saw God's love. And I knew I was changed forever. And for days, I was just, my wife, we, we weren't together at the time per se. We were, but we weren't. She didn't understand. It made her even more mad because it was so bad. I was such, I was just bad. I was a mess. She tried her whole lot, marriage to get me to go to church. And, <laughs> and now we seem to run dry and now I'm saved. Yeah, okay. So it was a hard time for her. And I was just, I knew I was changed forever. I, I couldn't stop thanking God for loving me and he's amazing and about three days in I was working and realized there ain't a pain in my body now I didn't read nothing about healing nobody prayed for me I didn't know it just came with the package of him loving me I didn't it just came old things passed away all things became new it wasn't I wasn't trying to get healed but I promise you, I was being loved. Are you following me? Yeah. I've learned since then that faith works through love. You say, well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Well, the word is God and God is the word and God is love. So it all is the same. So don't get, don't separate it and get the word as if it's apart from God's love. Because God so loved, he gave his word. God so loved the world, he sent his, the word that became flesh. So he so loved us, he sent his word. So why do we have his word? Because he loves you. Not so you can turn it into a principle to apply to get help. But to be loved by God. You follow me? So let's do this in this house. Let's keep praying tirelessly in faith. For everything that's not wholeness. And believe it has to change. And them cancers have to keep coming out. And bodies keep having to be getting whole. And, and let's throw away this kind of language. Well, I don't know why I didn't get healed. I don't know why it didn't happen. I don't know why nothing happened. When you release faith and you pray, you believe something always happens. Love's flowing. The Spirit's moving. God's bringing change. If you're prayed for in your life or you've been prayed for and you don't see something change, I'm not setting us up. You just got to talk about this stuff. The cynical would think, I'm, you know, ah, he's just covering because people ain't going to get healed. Well, I'm talking to the body of Christ, okay? You get prayed for in your life. Okay, who can relate to this? You've been prayed for in your life and you didn't see any change. And who's making sense of what I'm saying tonight? And then your mind became a big struggle for you and you had all those questions I'm talking about. Who's experienced that in your life? Be honest with me. And then it became a toil for you and a press for you and 
Right? You see how many people are honest and raising their hands? So watch this. You get prayed for. Sometimes we're afraid. Okay, I need, I need another show of hands. Who's been hesitant in the past to step out and pray for the sick because they're afraid nothing might happen? Come on, be honest. Do you see? So this mentality is serious and it's among us. It's never about nothing not happening. It's about you loving them and releasing the kingdom and praying in faith. It's never about a point in time. Okay, I'll close with this and then we're just going to pray for folks. Faith is never a point in time. Faith isn't something you do and then unplug. It's not something you try and then say, oh well. Faith is the position of the heart. Faith is a lifestyle. <laughs> Faith is the position of your heart. It's believing and receiving what he accomplished. It never changes. So watch this. A fellow like me says it's the will of God to heal. Do you believe that? Who believes it's the will of God to heal here? Okay. So when does faith ever unplug from that? So is it the will of God to heal? So then it's the will of God to heal. So we minister healing. We release faith. We pray over the sick. We lay hands on the sick and they shall. We don't go, bummer. We say, thank you, Father, for the great privilege and your, just your spirit and wholeness. And the person that's being prayed for that didn't see change, guess what they do? Father, I'll so pray. Tammy's another one of my heroes. Where's sweet Tammy? Tammy Espenshade, where's she at? She's out in the hall so we can talk about her. She's not even here. She's amazing. When she came to church the first night I ever met her, she's got serious thing of Lyme, it's neurological. She doesn't have the best report. John's doing all he can to help her. That little box he carries around there, you got it. And John, you're awesome. But she comes and this is all was new to her, right, Joe? This, this part was new. Missionary's girl and all that. So Jesus wasn't new, but this aspect of Jesus was new. And what we were preaching, she comes, we pray for her. Mm, bummer, right? This, this precious little girl, you know, she got big blue eyes and she's so sweet, you can't not like her. <laughs> she said to me one time, she came up and she said, oh, that Joe. She said, he just, and I was so mad. I was so mad at Joe. I said, okay. <laughs> she's like, I was so mad. I was just so mad. And I'm like, you don't even know what mad is. It was so funny. I mean, her so mad was better than most people's really good. <laughs> oh, you just have to know Tammy. So, so we pray for her, and it's like bummer, right? If you don't understand. Watch. You pray for her, and you just so want, who's ever been in this position? You just want the pain to go out of her. You just want her to move what she couldn't move, right? You just want her to be so okay. I don't think we're in here fly-by-night weekend warrior. Just, I think we care. We want people well, right? So I take this to heart. And I have to be very careful because I take it to heart that I don't just... Because that doesn't change anything. So we pray for her. Check your body, honey. Check, just check some things that were real obvious. She says, no. It just all really feels about the same. And inside you're like, Burr. you ever been there? <laughs> Who's ever been there? <laughs> you know, Todd and I, when we first started running together, doing a lot of stuff together, he's like, you know, he's pit bull anyway. We'd be praying and he's just grunting. <laughs> and I'm looking at him. <laughs> Let's hit it again. You know, hit it again. And that's serious. But we had to get a grip on that at some point because you just grunt yourself into frustration. It ain't changing nothing. You're just grunting. We've done it. Todd and I have done the grunt exchange so many times. We'll pray and we'll say, check it. And they'll go, nope. It's like a language in the spirit. <laughs> doesn't help nothing <laughs> so here's sweet Tammy and she's like no we prayed a couple times the same I tell a lot of people this 
a lot of times when I don't see things change because I, I know what the tendency is. Well, I went to the service. I was hoping something would happen. Oh, well, it didn't. Maybe in God's good time. Maybe sometime. Maybe God. I said, honey, this is all new to you, right? Yeah. I said, listen, just do yourself, do us, our hearts and yourself a big favor tonight. When you go home, you just thank God he loves you. And thank God that we surrounded you and prayed in faith and that he's moving on your behalf, that he's making things new, that he's removing pains and making you whole. And just thank him that his will is to restore you and you so receive it. Just something simple like that. Well, I got word back from her later that, and you know, see, you don't know the whole story because maybe because that was a while back and, and, and she just called me there a while back. It was seven year anniversary of being healed and left a phone message on my machine. It just melted my heart. Just seven years I've been healed. Because seven years from that time, John, they were telling her what? Quadriplegic, possibly from neurological Lyme or something. It was pretty bad. She was in a wheelchair. John was helping her. Right. So John was working with her. She was in a wheelchair when she met John. John saw some increase in improvement in her, a lot of good increase. The doctors without Dr. John and without Jesus were giving her not much time to be paralyzed, probably, right? Something like that. Joe and her were only married a couple years. They wanted to have a child. Well, they couldn't have a child because she has Lyme. They don't want to give Lyme to the baby. It just wouldn't seem right to get pregnant and try to have a baby when you have Lyme. It just, right? So here's this young couple. Bummer. Ugh, right? So she goes home and guess what she does? I get, she tells me the story. She sits down on her bed and she says, but that was really different tonight. It was really neat though. She's like, I felt so loved. People really loved on me. And, and God, I just really, a lot of what they said made sense. And I just thank you. You love me. And I just thank you for making me whole or whatever. However she prayed it like that. Don't quote that. But it was in the, that was the gist. And she went to bed smiling. Maybe not. But in her heart, she was good. Do you see what I mean? Body's still hurting. That sure beats, oh, this wretched pain, why doesn't God heal me? I just ruined how we prayed and I thought, yeah, right, healing. Well, uh. No, she just laid down. She wakes up in the morning, has no symptoms. The morning, no symptoms. She tells Joe, <laughs> not quite like this, but I'm healed, we can have a baby now. <laughs> And you think Joe would have said, Yahoo! And Joe said, No! <laughs> he said, We're not going to get pregnant until you just get your blood checked. It's just, and I remember her calling me too because she's funny. She said, I know I'm healed. I don't need my blood checked. I said, It doesn't hurt to get your blood checked. It doesn't offend God and it loves your husband. And I think it's amazing that he's saying that because it's just a conscience towards the baby. Just go get your blood checked. So she went and got her blood checked and was clean, and now they have their little girl. Yeah. Isn't that cool? But watch, it's a different picture. It's a different picture when you don't understand that and she goes home defeated. Goes home with nothing. Goes home with, well, maybe next time. Are you following me? Rather than goes home in relationship and fellowship and communion with God. Same pain, same symptoms, same God. Do you get this? It's very important. That little boy that from New York, that remember? And the little and, and he was running around there to his mama and he hadn't even tried to walk and stuff. It's like I just saw one a, a, a little autistic boy. See, I don't talk about this stuff much. John, you're getting a lot of freebies tonight. <laughs> little autistic, little little autistic diagnosis. Uh, a, a little boy with an autistic diagnosis, he's four or four or something. And you couldn't get his attention. It was like he was there, but he wasn't. I'm not being crude. I'm just trying to define he was unaware. And you're like, hey, little buddy. And you're going to pray for him. And he's like, he's not there. And the parents are like, can you please pray for him? And I said, they said, we, I know you say it's not about you, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's the break. And we were just wondering. I know my wife would. I said, man, I would love to pray for people. It's not that I don't want to pray for people. It's just how the church interprets some of this stuff. So I said, so we'll pray. Shh, no. <laughs> 
So, so we prayed for the boy, right? And he's exactly the same to your eyes after we prayed. And I looked at him and I said, listen, man, this is exciting. We can believe God over your son. We have the gospel. We can believe. I'm so pumped. Thanks for letting me in on this. I'm glad you let me touch your little guy. And they're like, oh, cool, okay. Thank God they understood. They've been listening to a lot of tapes. They weren't like, wow, man, no kapow bang. Wow, I thought Dan was anointed, man. No boy didn't even change. That was the afternoon. We came back in for evening service. Guess what he's doing? He's running around watching the other kids and watching them wave flags and interacting. And it was the first time in his life that he had ever shown awareness of anything around him like that. And he's just standing there watching all this. He had never spoken yet or anything. So next morning when I see him, guess what happens? He's coming up the hall and I said, hey, little guy. And he went, ah, and he ran behind his daddy and hit. And then I'm coming around tickling him and he's running around laughing. The day before, he's unaware of everything. You pray for him and he's still unaware and you let your soul drop and you let your eyes believe what you see and think what you see, you might let go of what's happening. You might let go of the power of God. You might let go of love that never fails. It's not a hit, miss, win, or lose. It's a position of the heart and thank you, Jesus, for the gospel. Period. You follow me? And I watch this little guy run around and I'm chasing him and he's hiding from me behind his daddy. And he has never interacted like that in four something years. That is not a coincidence. He's a work in progress. The Spirit of God is breathing on him. He, he yelled and made a noise because he has never talked. And I said, I said, hey buddy, I think all you need to do is teach your boy how to talk. Because he has a voice. Because he went, ah! You can turn ah into high. Because Jesus... You follow me? It's just so many testimonies like this we can tell. It's not a cop-out. It's not an excuse for the lack of power. It's all the power of God. The cynical doesn't understand what I'm preaching. The mocking, the unbelieving, that's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to the church. We can understand. We can keep going on and see fruit. That, that man came here. His, their little girl had a leg that was so short, it was the shortest leg I'd ever seen in my life. And she caught me back at the sound booth. Them people from New York. And you guys prayed for that boy. You passed him around and loved that boy and prayed on that little boy. Because you guys are awesome. I had a lady, by the way, come here. She had had a cancer diagnosis and she came from out of state to come here. And I got word back on an email that it was... She had never felt lo so loved here on a Saturday night. She didn't even know it was possible to be cared for and loved like you all took care of her and loved her and doted over her and prayed for her. And she said it was the most incredible loving experience of her life. The way you guys responded to her at the end when she needed prayer, whoever you were. Bravo. But that mama came and said, can you help me? Can you pray for my daughter? I know you didn't want to pray for anybody. You said you just wanted the church, but I was hoping you guys, it was she's a tiny little thing. Lifted up, she lifted up the blanket and her little leg was like half the length of her other leg. She had a tiny little leg and an irregular leg. And I said, yeah, I would gladly pray for your little baby. Oh my goodness, girl. Listen, and I started to tell her why it's right to believe. And while I'm talking, I look down and the leg's already coming the whole way out. And I said, do you see what God's doing for your little girl? And it looked like she was going to drop her baby. She went, <laughs> and, 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 the, and she has a, what is, pediatrician, whoever gives birth, and then you go back after a while. They have that all record charted, her leg, the length, and all that. But now they took her back to that doctor. It's the exact increment. It's exactly normal. Her skeletal, everything is exactly. And at birth, her leg was like this. And, now, and we watched it in front of our eyes, right at the corner of that sound booth. Watch that thing just go. Ding. So fun. <laughs> now, now, now watch what she did. Now watch what she did. You would have done it too. I understand. People do this stuff. She went, oh my God. She ran to her husband. Look. 
Look. I took her, I took her to Dan. That's what happened. Because they drove from New York for me to pray. He comes running over with tears in his eyes. Thank you for praying for my daughter. You must pray for my son. I said, I can't. You passed your son to 20 some of our people. They already prayed. But I can agree. I just bless him and agree. But I'm not taking your son and praying. See, some of you don't understand that. This is a Jesus thing. I wonder if just some little things that I understand is making a difference in some of those things, not my anointing. I said, I'm not going to pray for you. He said, he was offended. He was hurt. I said, I'm not praying for him. I watched. I said, these are the most loving people, faithful we're teachers here. These people are going after it. There's nothing I can do for your son that hasn't already been done. But I just bless what you're doing in him, God. And I thank you for the body of Christ in agreement. We win. We're a majority. Thanks for raising this boy up. And the guy's standing there like, that's your prayer? <laughs> and the boy's the same. I said, listen, the biggest mistake you can do is get your eyes on that boy. And not on Jesus. He said, yes, but I drove five hours. I said, you driving five hours is not your faith. Your faith is in Jesus, not driving five hours. It's not, I'll drive five hours and get healed. That's its works. So I talked to him about all this. He came back and testified that I had this talk with him. And I said, don't you leave here and be discouraged, sir. And he couldn't even hear me. He told me later he couldn't even hear me because he was so discouraged. He got to the hotel room, laid his boy down. He's the same. So he's bummed, bittersweet. Daughter's healed, son's not. That's rationale. That's human reasoning, wisdom. There's no faith, no receiving God's love. Father, thank you for what you did to my little girl. And thank you for what you're building up in my son. And I appreciate you making him whole and bringing him to fruition. God, thanks you're moving in my family. Yay, he should have been a wreck, excited. But rationale, got one, didn't get the other. Hmm, bummer, perplexed. Why her, why not him? What's the holdup? Where's the blockage? <laughs> you throw all that out. Out. Jesus. I was just preaching in a church. Now, I don't know why I'm telling you all these testimonies. I'm right in the middle of my great sermon. I was doing a way better than I am tonight. Serious, way better. And this guy decided to have a seizure on me while I'm preaching. It's like a lady tried to die that one time on me. In the middle of seven, eight, nine hundred people, she tried to die right in the center. That's not a coincidence. And I'm preaching on not being moved by adversity. I'm preaching on don't let anything change what you believe. And right in the middle of preaching it, the lady decides to die in the middle of the church. The girl couldn't find her vitals, couldn't find her pulse. They got 911. They're all bawling. Place is frantic. And I'm using it as a teaching tool, walking up the middle aisle, teaching why you never live in fear. And she's laying out, wiped out. And all I did was call her name and tell her to breathe and sit up. And she breathed and sat right up. She had no idea what was going on. She was mad at her friends for calling an ambulance. She called the ambulance back and told them to not come. And she was freaked out that they even, she was like, what is going on? She had no clue or nothing. She was completely whole. The young girl that had a nurse thing behind her that was, knew what to do said there was no vitals. But there's Jesus. Amen. So I'm preaching and this guy has a, a seizure right while I'm preaching my great sermon. And they're like, oh my God. And he's like, oh, and it's loud. Oh. Eyes roll up, boom, he's done. Stuff running everywhere. It was gross. And they already called 911 because everybody has cell phones but me. <laughs> See, you run with me. You better have Jesus because you can't call 911. <laughs> Yeah, or you better have your cell phone. Well, yeah, but see, if you have your cell phone and you're in that problem, I won't even know how to work it, so you got Jesus. I'm not against 911. You call 911, especially if you're trying to find faith or have fear. Don't, that's not the time to try to find faith. I'm not against 911. They called 911, and I'm walking back, and I said, now watch what came out of my spirit. Listen to me, people. Because they were trying to cast stuff off of him. You should have heard all the language going on back there. You foul devil. You spirit of seizure. <laughs> and I was walking back there. I said, listen, stop everybody. 
and the calm that comes over you, the way God lets you teach. I said, listen, I said, there's so much question when stuff like this happens. Is it spiritual? Is it physical? I said, what does it matter? It doesn't matter. Jesus, it's the same answer. Whether it's spiritual or physical, it's the same answer. We get so distracted. The answer is the same. It doesn't matter to me. It matters that Jesus is Lord. Period. So you go back, you ask his name. You say, Michael, this is coming off of you, buddy. You snap out of this right now. You come up, you come out of this right now. And the pastor watched it happen. He jumped while I was speaking. He was laying there. He's frozen. His eyes were white. He's got stuff all over the place. And he goes. <gasps> I said, it's all right, buddy. Just sit up, sit up, sit up. What's going on? He had no idea what happened. None, nothing. Jesus just woke him up. They looked at him. He had just got saved and water baptized two weeks before. They looked at him and the pastor said, you in this house that know Michael, take a good look at his face and tell me what you see. And the people looked and went, ooh, and they're all crying. You look at him, he's the most peaceful expression. Most, it was beautiful. So whatever come to try to, ooh, Jesus just trumped that thing and just said, ah, I think I'm going to even just extra bless him and take some stuff off and just bring some extra freedoms and just put peace on him. I think I'm just going to. So he's just sitting there like, ah. Oh. He just had a seizure. The paramedics came, did a full thing, and didn't even know what to do or say. They just, I don't know what happened. They just, he came back in the church and hugged me and sat down. And, and this lady comes walking up trembling. It started something. I'm a visitor. That's what she said. I'm a visitor. She said, I've been away from the Lord. I need to get right with God. And then other people had to get healed, and all kinds of stuff happened. John, I don't tell you this stuff. <laughs> it's very important when that man has his boy and he wants me and I'm his focal point and their little girl sealed. It's very important for me to understand, for you as the believer to understand. Because I'm, I'm I'm you check me on this, Pastor, but I'm a firm believer of this. It just keeps one person in faith to keep that door of heaven open. You have 10 other people involved, doubting, questioning. Man, you just locked in. Jesus. You get it? The sign follows the believer. So, so I can tell, I'm right here, and I'm pastoring him, and I'm telling him, don't you be disappointed. You leave this church and you this, is going to be a big mistake. And, but when he leaves, I can tell he can't hear. I can tell he's upset. And it didn't matter to me inside because God's mercy is greater than what he's not understanding. And I'm just believing that. I go lay on my bed. Thank you, God. You don't have no idea how I do this stuff. I go to my hotel and the people I didn't see manifest in a service, a healing. Father, I just thank you and I release faith and I just thank God for what's happening. Be amazed how I go back to those churches in the morning or six weeks later or whatever or get emails, how stuff changes. Yeah! We just saw a lady housebound for two years on oxygen and pain and hasn't even been out of her house for two years. 15 second prayer, didn't look like anything changed. Next day, total breathing, hasn't used oxygen since, walks the dogs every day all around the block and she's whole. But here's what we do. We pray and watch instead of pray and believe. So we pray and watch. And maybe get another banner, blow an extra shofar, or pray a little louder. And there's times that you contend, but don't turn it into works. You just keep speaking truth. Are you following me? But that, that you guys know that story. That guy went to the hotel and then they drove five hours in the morning. He said he was quiet. He told me personally, depressed. Quiet, he said it was the quietest five-hour drive. He gets home, he lets the wife take the kids. He's back in the bedroom unpacking, and he's discouraged. He's got a victory on one hand and a defeat on the other, because that's what rationale says. And they laid that little boy in the room who had never even tried to walk or stand, let alone walk. And he heard his wife screaming, and he ran in, and there's his boy standing in the middle of the room. Now, daddy's a mess. Because he's living face value. 
And we're living gospel. So there's this little boy standing in the middle of the room. God's so merciful, He gives him enough time to click on his cell phone, get the video thing, and get his first steps across the floor. Why? Because God said walk. He doesn't need to learn to crawl first and build up leg muscles and do the whole thing. He's already what? A couple years old, he should have been walking long ago. So God just said walk. He holds all things together by the word of his power. If God says walk, you're walking. It doesn't have to make sense. It it can defy all kinds of stuff. God said walk. And And the dad is in the bedroom missing relationship with Jesus and receiving God's love. Come on, when you're not receiving God's love, you are not doing good. I don't care how much you tell me you are. When you're not receiving God's love, you are not doing good. Yeah, that's a strong word, but it's true. (laughs) He's not doing good. But guess what God was? Loving the whole time. Isn't that awesome? I'd have loved that boy to jump off of dad and run around this church when we prayed. I'm looking forward to more and more of that kind of stuff happening. But I'll tell you what, we better be mature and grown enough that when he doesn't leap on that floor and run, we know how to handle it and don't change, budge, or shift. And we don't let the cynical and the doubting and the unbelieving or the what seems to be right to a man become our theology. We let the word of God be true. You getting this? And I got really late because Shane took a long time with his testimony. So (laughs) (laughs) That's messed up, ain't it? (laughs) He's back there going, that is so messed up. (laughs) We're going to pray for some folks. I usually don't get involved, but I'm going to pray for two or three myself. I just feel like it now. I got myself riled up, and I ain't going to be grunting either. (laughs) But let's pray for anything that would be considered sickness in this house, and let's attack it with faith. And I don't care. Listen, man, you've been prayed for a hundred times for something, and it didn't change. Forget that. It isn't a thing. It's, it's just you receiving agreement. It's you getting reestablished. You might use it as a contact point of faith tonight and say, you know what? I, I, and if you're in a place of faith, you don't have to come up here and be, if you, if you understand what I'm saying, you don't have to do that. But sometimes it's good. A contact point of faith. I just had somebody tell me the last place I preached that I'm afraid to ask for prayer because of it not happening. And I thought, man, we got some real problems on this topic. And I said, no, no, honey, give me your hands. And I started teaching her, and I took it, and I prayed with her. Amen? Amen? I'm never afraid to believe. I said, I'm never afraid to fail. I'm more afraid to not believe, because everything follows the believer. If you don't believe, we've already failed. It's not about failing. It's about believing. You get what I'm saying? So you just use this as a contact point of faith to where, man, it isn't even about anything other than, look, God loves me. It's my covenant privilege in his love, through what Jesus accomplished for me to receive wholeness because he said he wants to redeem my life. So why not go for that and let it come? Amen? And in your life, whether you're a minister or a recipient of prayer, don't ever change that position. He loves me. I'm going to walk this thing out by faith. It's the position of my heart, not a point in time. You follow me? You got sickness in your body. You need prayer for anything. I want you to come on. We're going to use the front today rather than just stand up or raise your hand. I want you to come on up here. We're going to pray for all the sick tonight. If there's anything in your body that's considered sickness, anything that's less than wholeness or original value. See? See this fellow coming with a cane? I'm just going to just highlight something a little. He's just been believing and encouraged. When I first met him, and this has nothing to do with me. He's been prayed for. He's been walking with Jesus. But when I first met him, When I first met you, you had the things that hooked to your arms, both of them. And it was hard. I mean, you were, he was, he had to, you know, you're watching him walk. You're like, whoa, man, right? And and then he went down to one hook to the arm, and now he just has a cane. Come on. Now, somewhere along the line, you can judge that, criticize that, and miss the beauty of that. But here's the deal. You're not growing weary and well-doing and believing God and His will is well-doing. You're going to continue on. You're not going to take a person. You're not going to get discouraged. You're not going to throw away the gospel. You're going to say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing. And time's going by, but guess what? There's increase. We were coming across a lot today, and I said, man, you're like walking way better. He lifted the cane off the ground and just kept walking. He's just using it for support, but he's walking like I hadn't seen him walk before. 
Now, I haven't seen him for a while. And you say, well, that's a long time. It's the power of God. We're on to something here. We're not hit, miss, win, or lose. Position of the heart, receive. Come on. Humanly, physically, with his situation and condition at the age he was with them thing, they're not telling you it's going to get better. It can't get better. You're already where you to be, right? Because of the condition. And you, you see the metal things already that are strapped to your arms? That's what he had. And if you would come up and play out how you walked, I mean, it wasn't easy with those two things. It was very hard. Because I remember, because I remember we were at the conference and praying, and Leif was there, and I was like, Randy Clark's. I was, I, was, I was speaking to them legs. You felt the power of God come on you too. That one. We were like, come alive, legs. <laughs> so, so but, but here's the deal. It's been a walk. It's been a journey in the gospel. And he's still not walking completely whole like, say, I would walk. But he's come a long way, and we can keep on coming. You see what I mean? Perfect example. Yay. Thanks for being here, man. <laughs> Live example. Okay. Now, do you see how many people are going through different things with sickness and stuff? We want to love them, church. We want to come up here. I need you guys. I need you to come up and get somebody and talk to them and pray for them. Be sincere, be humble. There's no, it's not about prophecy. It's not about anything right now. It's about the name of Jesus. Power in the name to break every chain. So here's all I need you to do when you come up here. Believe it's the will of God to heal. And believe He loves the person. And that's pretty simple now that Christ was crucified for us to do that, right? And I'm telling you, healing's going to happen all over the place. I need you, church. Come on. Please, come. Get your hands high if you need prayer. And people will come to you. As soon as they get to you, put your hands down. What's that? Let's take testimonies when they, get, when they, when they feel something radically changed. Yeah. We, as, as, as they pray for you, you feel something change, shift, get better, you wave your hand or something and let Pastor Don will have the mic or something and he could, we could just find out what's going on in this house. Come on, church. I need your help. I need you to help me pray. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be healed. Pain come out of the body. Simple prayers. Whatever the condition, leave. Spine be whole. Shoulder be healed. If you don't have anybody to pray for, you lift your hand high. Somebody will get to you. I'm going to get you, bud. 